Brian did me an, an awesome favor of making me last of two days full of sit-down meetings where people are talking at you. You guys had lunch, then had breakouts, so I'm sure everybody's ready for a fucking nap. Uh, so this is the favorite time to talk to people because they're dialed the fuck in. Um, anyway, first and foremost, uh, my name is Jacob Stoller. Um, so the first time I've done anything like this in a room full of people I would consider to be my, my peers, actually. Uh, there's people in this room that are doing bigger things than I have, and I look up to them, so to be up here doing the talk is kind of cool. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I've kind of got my hands in a lot of stuff starting at a young age. Um, I've got a marketing background, I've done sales stuff, I've taken companies public, uh, I've built law firms, I've, I've done home remodeling stuff, furniture stuff, I mean, if it's a market and you can sell stuff in it, I probably screwed around with it a little bit, so. Um, anyway, what we're going to start, or do to start this off is we're going to kind of have a little bit of an argument about some very mundane things. Um, and so kind of the way it works when I do stuff um, is like I'm going to walk around, I'm probably going to call on people. Um, if you want to be get called on, I'll, I'll call on you. If you're on your phone, I'm going to call on you. If you're falling asleep, I'm going to call on you. If you don't want to be called on, I'm going to call on you. Um, and we're going to get some, um, some kind of feedback to kind of set the trend for what we're going to talk about. Um, this first part is meant to be a little bit fun. Um, we're going to kind of go through some things that I think that everybody does every day that requires some decision making and things like that. Um, and so the one I'm going to open with is when you guys make a bowl of cereal, give me a show of hands of people who put milk in the bowl first. So there's three of them. I was sure Zizzo would be doing that because he probably weighs the shit and then puts it in the bowl. <laughs> um, so most of you guys put cereal in first. Why? So you, yours is science-based. You have to figure out how much milk you need to make it not soggy. Do you have like a speed that you eat at so that you know how long it takes to get soggy? <laughs> I think that's fair, especially with like frosted mini weeds. You know, because those ones will suck up the milk if you're not careful. And then like there's no frosted on it. It's just fucking mini weeds. Right. And, and you have to drink the milk to get any of the frosting. Um, which then you get all of the like the weird residue from the wheat stuff in it, and it's kind of gross. Um, I talked about this one in the kitchen. Like, show of hands, when you go to like brush your teeth, do you get the toothbrush wet first? Yeah. 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 Or do you put toothpaste on it first? Toothpaste first. Who, who's toothpaste first? Okay. Who, who, who doesn't use any water and just puts toothpaste on the toothbrush and goes to town? Okay. Yeah? There's a lot of judging going on in here right now. <laughs> like, we were all friends a moment ago. <laughs> now, like, I heard what you do with your toothbrush, dude. I don't know if we can talk anymore. Um, getting dressed, are you like a right leg pant first or are you left? Who's right? Think about it. Left? Anybody jump off the bed both legs into their pants? I got friends with skinny jeans that that's the only fucking way they're getting in their pants. They got these little holders and then they get on their bed and jump into them like that. Um, let's see, what else do we got? When you go out of town, how many of you guys, like, if you're going out of town to, like, for a week or something, show of hands, how many people actually unpack and put their clothes away? Like, drawers, hangers, all that stuff? How many of you guys just live out of your suitcase? Okay, those of you guys that live out of your suitcase, do you have a separate pile for like dirty clothes and there's a system for it? Like you know where your dirty clothes and stuff like that goes? Okay. Does anybody in here cut their burger in half or into quarters before they eat it? Okay, so I actually do that because I'm weird about getting like my hands messy. Um, I have OCD about it. So like I start, now my wife does it and she thinks that I'm turning her into a psycho. Uh, I didn't do this before you. I'm like, but it's efficient. Like, you know what I mean? The burger stays together. Like, everything is great, and it's awesome. And so that's, yeah, 100%. And, like, if, if there's, like, only four pickles on it, you can make sure that all four of them have pickles, you know? Yeah. That's a little weird. I admit that. That's fine. <laughs> um, so this is a big one everybody always kind of is weird about. So when you get done in the shower 
and you pick up your towel, do you dry off your body or your face first? Is everybody face? Show of hands. Hair first? Okay. So like you're top down? Okay. So <laughs> I, had, I actually had a discussion about this literally two days ago. So this guy got married, and they hadn't lived together until they got married, right? And when he gets out of the shower, he gets out of the shower wet. So he's got water all over the tile. And, and so, like, she'll walk in to, like, get ready or whatever and slip. And then, like, he's like, but I dry it when I'm done. She's like, but that doesn't protect me while you're not done. And so they got into, like, a big knockdown drag-out fight over him just, like, getting out of the shower. Um, and... To his argument, though, they have like one of those corner walk-ins, and he's about my size. It's not big enough to stand in and dry off. So like, there's going to have to be some give and take. Like, He's going to have to dirty another towel or something like that when he gets out. Um, actually, so I, I want to do this. I need like four people just to, to volunteer. You want to come up? Two, three, four? All right. I want you guys to show me the best way to draw an X. X. Yep. Yeah, you dry it all the time. The letter X. So he was he was left down in the cross. Yeah, that's not how I would go. Let's see. I'm gonna go right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> he was paid. <laughs> Whoever comes up first. Okay. Yep, I've seen that before. I was going to say, I noticed nobody started at the bottom. Does anybody, when they draw an X, they start at the bottom? This way and then down? No? Okay. Um, when you make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, who does the peanut butter first? Of course. Both? Okay. And then jelly? On both sides? Just on one? Does anybody start with, like, literal butter? And then peanut butter and jelly? My mom used to do that. I grew up on a farm. I'm a hick. It's kind of my fault. Um, so a big one, too, is when you get in your car, what's the first thing you do? Seatbelt? I, I plug my phone in. <laughs> you start the car first? Okay. Okay. I'm actually, I'm like trying to think about it. Yeah. Cool, I'll close the door. Okay. <laughs> I have, that's fair. Yeah, usually it's like when you get into cars that have like bucket seats or whatever, you have to like do the whole boxer thing. Because like us guys that have pants that fit our legs, they don't fit our waists. So, like, when we climb into the sea, all the shit just moves. Like, it's probably awkward to watch for strangers. Like, you just got in your car. What the fuck are you doing? Um, so, to segue into this, what do all of the things that we're talking about have in common? It's a system, right? We have a system for everything that we do in our lives, from brushing our teeth, to getting dressed, to making cereal, to making sandwiches. Um, and so everything that, that we do, we make decisions on it. It's very systemized. It's based in efficiency. And all of this stuff just comes second nature. So when I'm asking these questions, a lot of people actually had to think about which way they do this stuff. Because we just do it, right? The thing is, we didn't always just do it that way. There was something that we had gone through that we decided, okay, this is the way that makes the most sense. Has anybody in here moved in the last like six or eight months to a new house? So either one of you guys, do you go to the grocery store the same way that you did when you first moved in? No, because there's that fucking school zone or the stop sign where the lady with the dogs always is. But you adjust your system kind of on the fly because you're trying to get to the grocery store quicker. Um, so the next question I'm going to ask, and people can kind of shout them out. I'm going to catch what I can and try and write it up, up here. Um, <coughs> 
Like, and, and this can be, I'm going to ask like what things you're going through that you're struggling with. It doesn't have to be professional. It could be marriage stuff. It could be personal things. And I'm just going to ask you, you know, kind of to give me some examples of stuff that you're trying to make better. Um, and like show of hands in here. I mean, are, is, are there people in here that have businesses that are, are you know, 20, $25 million businesses? People that are 10, 12, 5? So while we're going through all of this, I want you to listen to the people whose hands you saw go up first or hands you saw go up last and listen to the stuff that they're talking about because it doesn't matter at what level of business you're at, you're all going to have most of these problems. Um, and it's, people always think like, oh, when you have a bigger company, the problems are different. They're really not. They're, the way that all of you are going to go through it, the stuff, the changes you're going to make, the staffing issues you're going to have, the communications probably you're going to have, all that kind of stuff, it happens on the, the lower levels as it does the big. And the sooner that you go through it and you make your changes and you make your systems better and things like that, the easier it is for you to scale and grow. Um, the hardest part about it, and you'll kind of hear more, more as we get into it, we kind of get uh, paralyzed when it comes to making a change because we think that we're going to choose the wrong decision. But if we tie it all back to the way that we design how we get dressed, how we make a sandwich, it's all trial and error. But in our head, we don't think that the impact is going to be as large as it is when we're looking at these small things. But like if, if I've saved three hours going to the grocery store because I avoid this, the school zone, that's probably a pretty good adjustment that I made. But there's a chance I took a wrong left turn before I found the right route to get to where I was going. Um, and so kind of what we're going to get into as we start listing these out, we're going to kind of go through and, and walk through some of the issues and some of the problems things are, that people are saying that they're having. And we're going to talk about systems that we've all created to try and skirt some of these issues. So it doesn't have to be industry specific. It can be vague if you wanted to. Um, you don't have to get any specific details. You could say something basic as, you know, communicating with my wife or, or whatever. Um, but I just want to take some examples. So maybe you got them. Training systems for my team without systems. That was a lot straighter than I thought it would be. I'm kind of proud of myself for that. Um, what else? Um, as, as we grow, we currently have about 45 employees, but I'm noticing as we get bigger and bigger that we have an issue with leaders being comfortable having coaching conversations. It's almost like getting a level of comfort to have uncomfortable conversations. So we have a lot of things where everyone knows what problems are amongst each other, okay. but they're really afraid to talk to each other about it. So that's one of the things I'm working on is trying to build trust amongst the team. So Anybody else? Finding and hiring good people. Motivating sales people. Anybody else? Emotional intelligence. I was actually waiting to hear if somebody would say something like that. Like, just for insight, I'm a very non-emotional person. I look at everything from a very logic-based and reason standpoint. My wife is very emotional. So, so when it comes down to having talks and, and communicating with her, there's a lot of systems that I've literally had to build into my life to make sure that I recognize who she is and how she has to receive information in order for us to communicate effectively. Uh, because if I don't do those, I'll run her over. Um, and she'll, she'll go back to being upset because she's not going to be upset in front of me about it because like, she'll think it's her looking weak or something like that, but she'll submit just because I'm an intense person. Um, so if we get into an opinion-based discussion, if you let me run you over, I fucking will. Um, and so with my wife, I have to make sure that I, I have systems in place to kind of check myself to make sure that 
she's getting information in the way that she needs to hear it for the message to get accepted, if that makes sense. Anything else? Because we can start with these. If you think of any, I mean, obviously, you're, you're more than welcome to, to throw them out if they come up with them. We can honestly start with the training people who don't have personal systems. The thing is, they do. All of the stuff that we just talked about is a system. The thing is, people don't think about systems the way that I'm painting them. Because these are decisions that we have to make every single day just to exist. The problem is, when we were like five, some, like, people were dressing us. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? You weren't waking up at five and, and going and picking your stuff. And if you did, you probably looked like a, um, a teenage mutant cowboy. Because um, that would probably be what I would be trying to go to school in <laughs> if you let me dress myself when I was five. <laughs> I have one cowboy boot on. And like, um, but that's, you know, your parents would come in and they would put your pants on for you. At some point, you started sitting on the ground and like pulling both of your pants up and standing up and hanging on to stuff. But you started developing those systems when you were very, very young. And over time, you kind of perfected the systems, the ones that made the most sense to you, and then you started using them repeatedly. So if you start thinking about all the systems that you have that you're already like working on and working through, and you apply the same exact principles to creating any other system you want in your life, it's all by trial and error and failure. So when you've got people who don't have like personal systems, it's easy to start when you've got like one challenge for them. Talk about something that they wish they were better at in their life, and then I would go through with them, figuring out a system to fix the problem that they're saying that they have. It could be something very simple. I, I suck at waking up in the morning. I mean, most people would be like, well, put your phone across the room, or like, but everybody has a system for that. And then once you're good at it, you change the system. The phone doesn't have to be across the room anymore. You can put it back by your bed. Well, I have trouble staying asleep at night. Like, don't touch your phone when you wake up. <laughs> it's as easy as that, for, for me anyway. Because if I touch my phone when I wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning, I will be up until 3 fucking 30. Every time. No fail. So I, I can't touch my phone. So when you have, if you have someone that doesn't have a personal system, I would go through and I would find one thing that they feel like they personally need to work on, and I would coach them on developing the systems to fix that singular problem. This way, a couple of things happen. One, you're not solving the problem for them. I, I'm, some of you guys have been in, in management, leadership, ownership for two decades. Anybody that you solved the problem for, didn't they come back and ask you about the same fucking problem 20 more times? Yeah. They didn't retain it. They never had to learn it. They never had to troubleshoot it. They never had to solve the problem because you did it for them. And you can watch that happen with people's kids. Like, how many of you guys are parents in here? I'm sure you guys are all very active in your kids' lives, right? There's a lot of parents who are not. So when the kid has a problem, they fix the problem for the kid. And then when the kid's 16 years old, they have no troubleshooting capabilities whatsoever. They don't know how to solve a problem because you never let them get frustrated because all you want to do your, your kid to do is shut up. So now as, as leaders that own businesses that are hiring these young kids, we have to literally teach them how to troubleshoot. It is fucking mind-blowing to me. But that's part of the, that's part of the gig now. So if you're going to a, a staff member and you're going to try and help them get into a system type deal, you're going to have to let them struggle. And they're going to get frustrated with you about it. And you guys are probably going to have some very uncomfortable conversations while they're frustrated. And that's going to decide whether or not they turn into the people that they can become or if they're going to stay the people that they are. And then you come into the other thing we were talking about, how do you find the right people, right? How many of you guys have heard that hiring is a skill? Everybody says it, right? I don't think it is. Like, you've got a job that you want to fill? They need a job. You guys are fucking selling the same thing to each other. They're going to tell you all the great things about them. They're only going to give you um, references of people that are going to say good shit about them. And you're going to have an, an interview, and they're going to be on their best behavior. Your skill is getting the fuck out. A skill is knowing when to fire people. A skill is recognizing when someone is toxic for your organization. When I was building um, the law firm in Chicago, I think when I met them, they were doing like 1.7 a year. We were trending at 50 
like 23 months later. And I used to get in trouble because I was hiring people from the south side of Chicago. They had names like Shanita and whatever. I was hiring, I didn't care who they were. I hired a bunch of gay people. I hired like, but I'm, I'm in corporate meetings and people are like, can you go and talk to them and tell them to use a more phone friendly name? I'm like, no, like y'all can go have that conversation. <laughs> I'm not doing it. Um, the thing is, all of those types of people were the top five people on the sales board 12 months later. Because I wasn't, I'm hiring the person, right? I'm not hiring the resume. How many resumes have you looked at that were absolutely fantastic and you hired them and like you thought it was the worst decision you ever made? Like you're going to be wrong more often than you're right when you're hiring people. You're better off trying to give people an opportunity of people that need it on your entry level jobs. Those are the people that are going to bust their ass for you. Are they going to be a culture fit? We don't know. But the people that come in that think that they have all of this stuff and know everything and have done everything, they're going to try and tell you more about what you need to be doing than they're going to take information from you. I'd rather have the hungry guy, you know, that doesn't have the, the high-end education, but those are the types of people that I always picked up. And a lot of you guys in here have, have companies that are a little bit more, I would call it blue-collar, but like, you don't need an Ivy League education to come in and work with most of us. You just need to want to fucking do the work. And if you can do that, I mean, the ability to make a bunch of money with people that understand the value of money is very high. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give people that are, are kicking ass for the brand everything that they could ever want. Because those are, I can't, I don't even, I can't coach that. So for me, when it comes down to, to building systems about actually finding good people, I, I go off a of feel. And most of you probably have decent bullshit meters. But the thing is, if you're like me at all, you have a bit of a bleeding heart because you were kind of an underdog. So you want to keep the person that you think that you can fucking fix. You can't want something for somebody who don't want it. You can give them all the books in the world, you can give them all the podcasts in the world, but if they don't want to be that person, never become it. So if, if I could tell you about anything about a system for finding people, it's knowing when to cut bait. I, I mean, you, know, you all know converse, how to have a conversation on how to hire somebody. Like, there's entire companies surrounded around coaching people how to hire. I've listened to at least 10 of them at other businesses that I did consulting for, and it didn't make any fucking sense to me. So. Um, hiring an executive, I feel like it's a different deal. Are any of you guys hiring for upper management? Like C-suite C type, type stuff? W what are you looking for? General manager. Okay. For location and all Oh, so you're going to open up a new spot. That's where our original spot is. Oh, okay. We just literally fired our sales manager. There. Oh, well, that's a good reason to need a new one. <laughs> uh, and you don't have anybody internally that you'd consider? No, I'm 90% stealing one from a competitor. Oh, that's cool. Fuck those guys. Um, <laughs> no, um, I mean, as far as finding candidates go, what do you think, or what do you think your struggles have been? Uh, we recruit really well. I mean, a lot of our, our I think you're talking about a little bit back there, we focus on like younger, non-trained yep. industry people. Um, and we're finding more and more that just, just the, the breed of youngins this, this day and age are they don't want to work, and they come in and they work, and it's like, ah, you know, can't you just give me, like, all the money, and I don't really have to come to the office? And so it's, like, almost like we have to, like, stop looking for, like, younger people and start looking for guys in their, like, 40s and 50s because they get it still, so they have a good opportunity to earn well. They're, they actually appreciate it more than the young guys do. And that was kind of what I was talking about, trying to hire the people that want it. You know what I mean? Like, my dad's in his 60s, and I remember when he quit doing wealth management stuff, he couldn't get hired anywhere. The dude could sell anything he wanted him to, but there's a, a disconnect between technology and someone his age, right? And also, sales plays. Because there is no hard clothes anymore. People have fucking internet. Like, you can't act like this is the last Toyota Corolla in fucking Dallas. <laughs> Because they will pull their phone out and be like, motherfucker, there are three up the street. And, like, and so the, the way that you close now is more service-based. So trying to go and get a guy that's in his 50s that's used to doing home remodeling stuff is going to try and do a slam close just on nature. 
and you're going to have to go through culture training to try and get them to understand your processes on how you, you go through it or do your price drops or, or whatever. And a lot of them won't, they won't be able to latch onto it because they did what they've been doing for 40 years. Um, and so when it comes, like I said, s system stuff for finding people, I honestly just, I move as quick as I can. Um, and it sounds weird because it's, it's volume based and you're fucking with people's lives, but you're giving them an opportunity. So when you take it away, you're not supposed to feel bad about it. And I think, I, I mean, I do. When I let somebody go, I think they have kids. I know they've got bills. At this point, I probably know some of their personal struggles. I've probably lent them money. I've probably turned their cell phone back on. And I still have to go and tell them like, hey, not a fit, sorry. And I have to send them back to figure it out. But if they can't, if we've gotten to a point where I'm letting them go, we've had enough conversations where they've had a ton of opportunities to either take coaching and change and be better or move on. And those are the systems within your company that are the most effective. Do you develop a good culture where people feel like they're part of a team? Do they feel connected to the brand? Do they feel like their, their amount they're getting for the work they're putting in is value? Do they think they're, they're getting that back? Um, and it's, you generally have a good idea of how that works. How many people are in here are, are in their first year and a half or three years of business? A couple people? When you open your business, your pay rates are usually lower than most of the people that you're competing with because you don't have liquid capital to go to, to, go to war over the good guys, right? So if you're hiring salespeople and you're a brand new company, you're getting the fucking alcoholics, you're getting the guys that can't hold a job, you're getting the dudes that will accidentally step into the fucking road when there's a utility vehicle company, you know what I mean? And those are the guys that you're hiring. Why? Because they're the only guys that are gonna take a shot on a brand no one's ever heard of, right? The thing is, as you progress through all of those jobs, some of those guys turn into some of the best fucking employees you've ever had. Why? They're at an age now that they understand They've been fucking around for too long. So if you develop a good culture and you have good systems inside your business to train people up and make them feel valued, sometimes those people will turn their whole lives around and it'll become a staple in your, in your business. But you get a feel for whether or not that person's gonna become that person within probably two months. But they always say it takes six months to get um, like proficient at whatever you're doing. So if you've got systems in your business that get people to six months, they should be autopilot at that point, would you say? How many of you guys, like if you find somebody to be toxic or not a fit, how many of you, you cut bait within 90 days? Most people? Is there like a process for that? Do you have a three strike rule? I mean, do you have a three strike rule? Okay. No? Okay. What do you do in the first 90? Okay. So it's just like if, if they don't look to be putting in the work or they're not trying, you just move on. Does anybody else do that? I bleed on guys. Do you really? I'm the asshole that when it's finally time, I'm rough. That's me. <laughs> That's me. I'm putting it down dirty. Yeah. But I'll go six months, I'm trying to get a guy up to speed and like. Like you said, pay the cell phone bill. Come on, let's. Every opportunity there ever was, and when it's finally done, it's like, fuck you, get up. That's that's my that's my biggest shortcoming is that, like I I didn't come from shit. My parents got divorced when I was like three. Um, I grew up in a trailer that had a hole big enough through it where I could stick my hand out and catch snow. Like so, I was an underdog, right? I didn't I didn't nothing was given to me. I worked for everything I had. So when I see people and they're in similar situations than me, I ignore all of the other shit we don't have in common, and I latch on to just these three, and I'm like, you're going to be the fucking man. And like, they're not. <laughs> but, but like, it's my fault because I set them up to fail because I put, I'm, I'm putting all of this energy on them that they don't even want. Um, and it took me a long time to recognize that I had that as a problem. Um, but, but that, I mean... Like I said, as far as hiring people goes, your system, honestly, to start off with is to be quick about it. Trust your gut. Listen to your instincts. You've been doing it long enough that you know who's a piece of shit and who isn't. Um, and that's the, the quickest way to move on from it. Whew. Um, the communication thing I've found to be one of the easier things to coach 
And it's, I don't know, I kind of sound like an asshole saying that because everybody struggles with it. Um, a little bit about me personally, like I have Asperger's. So I'm not necessarily the most personable person. Um, I don't really look people in the eyes. I look past people a lot. Um, I get fidgety. Like if you small talk me, I might walk away during the conversation, <laughs> even if it's just us two. Um, because I don't know how to talk about the weather, and it makes me uncomfortable, and I feel like I'm wasting my time. Um, and that's just like a quirk I have. So if you met me 20 years ago, and like we're obviously talking about systems, it takes me 22 minutes to get ready. So if we have dinner plans at 6.30 and I gotta leave at six, I start getting ready at 38 after. If you called me at 50 after and said that you moved dinner, I'd be like, fuck this. And I would sit on the couch and I wouldn't go. So a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about, I had to fix myself. Um, and obviously, I had to go through my own processes to do it. But communication is actually a really easy skill. The only reason why people struggle with it is because they struggle with being direct. People are not comfortable being direct. They're not comfortable having people be direct. And that's because no one does it anymore. Parents even do it. They negotiate with their kids. Have you ever watched it in, like, Walmart? And they're, this kid is being a total fucking asshole, chucking like cans of beans and shit down the thing. And they're like, if you stop doing it, I will get you candy. There's a fucking reward for throwing beans. I wish I would have known that. I'd have thrown all the fucking beans. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'd have walked out of there with like 12 donuts, all the fucking Skittles. Like, because I'm getting rewarded for being an asshole. And like, that's how, how it all starts when they're young. So like when you're hiring people that are coming out of those types of situations, you're almost like a parent in this situation where you have to teach them. Sometimes you're going to say stuff and people aren't going to like it. Sometimes I'm going to say stuff to you and it's going to hurt your feelings and you're going to have an emotional reaction to it. I'm not responsible for how you feel about it, but if you feel bad, it's because something is broken. And people don't accept that as an explanation. But when you sit down and you talk to people, like there's a system to a conversation. You have your discovery. What's wrong? What's the problem? Right? And with my sales guys, I would be like, if you got a problem and you want to cuss at me for 20 minutes just to get on a level where you can actually tell me what's wrong, I'm fine with it. If that's your process, call me all the names in the book. I'm not going to take it personal. And there are guys that definitely use that. <laughs> so, so I learned words like during stuff like that that I didn't know existed. Um, but that was their process to get to a point where they could sit down and actually talk to me calmly about the, pro the problem they were having. The thing is, I had to learn how they operated. And I think as leaders, I would say most of us are intelligent and we're good at problem solving. So when we get someone who doesn't understand why something is broken, we get frustrated because they don't understand it. And it comes out while we're talking to them. So they're going to shut down because our tone is making them feel like they're stupid, right? And we're not asking enough questions. We're doing a lot of talking. Any of you guys guilty of that? Yeah. The only reason why is we're comfortable in what we're doing. We know what we know, and we've been where we've been. They haven't, especially if they're newer. So if we don't have a system to uncover all of the stuff that we're going through with the, the staff that we're dealing with, like, we're not running the play with everybody. And that's when we get to our repetition stuff. We talked about PB and, and J sandwiches. We talked about toothpaste. We talked about going to the grocery store. That shit is second nature. When you guys are, are, are married and your wife is, like, stomping around the house, like, that's your signal that you need a date night, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You can tell. But it's, it's from repetition. That's a trigger, Right? The longer that you're around employees, the longer you understand the way that their behavior works. You guys literally build a system of how you deal with those people. But it, it comes through repetition. And we don't subject ourselves to repetition enough, and we move really fast between stuff, and people feel like they get left behind during it. And then we've got staff who thinks that we're assholes because we didn't sit down and go and run the play. So if you have a problem with, with getting people to communicate, it's because at a high level, there isn't a whole lot of it happening, and it's very segmented. Like, you were the one who asked that, right? So you don't have a problem going and talking to the leaders about it. They have an issue with going down and talking to the people that below them. Mm -hmm. So I'll ask a couple of questions. You don't have to go, I mean, you can go as deep as you want. Um, would you say that 
that most of the people that are in the leadership role, were they promoted? Um, yeah, so then I have one, my director, um, I hired her from outside the organization, and she came in, she's, she's, a, she's 40 or 41, mm -hmm. and she's been in, in a management director role for a long time, so she's like, I'm like, when she came on board, I was like, oh, hallelujah, thank you, like just the fundamental thing. Yep terms of communicating with people, coaching conversations, etc. She had, but yeah, it's mostly the newer, younger guys that are coming up from being a technician. These are the guys that are super hungry. They're, they're peak performers. They align to the culture themselves, yep. but they have a real hard time getting others to do the same. And it's coming through that that inability to have those tough conversations. Well, and so the reason why I asked if they were promoted, one of the things I've always noticed, and, and it doesn't matter what industry I'm in, if people were peers at one point, and one, one person becomes no longer a peer or they become in a leadership role, they're still buddy-buddy with everybody below them. And the, the reason why they have it is because they haven't set an expectation for the people who they now manage. So realistically, there isn't a whole lot that you can do to enforce that. It's gonna be something that they have to do. Like when you hired your new director, that person and they came in, did they do any team building stuff? Yeah, we have, like we have come together. We didn't do anything like outside, but we did have like a, a meeting where we brought everyone together, kind yep. of rolled around, and we had an all-company meeting um, at night after work. Yep. Would you say, how long has she been with the company now? Two months. Okay. So it's been eight weeks, roughly? Yeah. Do you say that people follow her naturally? Yeah. And why do you think that? Um, because it's, a, it's, a, it's that respect thing. Okay. She came in fresh, so probably what we're speaking to. Yep. She's a new, she's new blood, and she yep. came in right off the rim with, with that. She commands that respect. So when you sat down and you offered the leadership role to the guys who got promoted, what did you tell them or were your expectations for them in that role? So we outline, we outline like everything we do is based on core values, and I learned that the hard way. But <laughs> Everybody did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so basically for them, I'm constantly preaching to them that they obviously have to be the examples and, and lead, live the core values and be ambassadors of the core values deliver results, solve problems, and then they have to hold others to do the same. So right. Me, but I'm constantly reminding them, hey, what are you, and I'm trying to shift, like, what, from what you said, from telling them what to do, to asking them, hey, we're off track right now, right? Like, what do you think you should do right now? So that's a bit like a, I was gonna, that was literally going to be my next question. <laughs> like, asking questions and having them to give me what they think the best solution should be, rather than me just being, like, the answer. So I'll give you a good lateral. Um, so, a little bit like a backstory on my wife, her parents always made all of her decisions for her. So if she came to them and was like, I need new tires, she'd be asking her dad, like, show me how to buy tires, right? How did you guys learn how to buy tires? Did your parents show you? Or did like, one day you needed tires and you were like, fuck. What's that? Yeah. I mean, it's that you're, you naturally went through a problem solving process, right? You're like, fuck, I need tires. Who has tires? I'm going to call people with tires. My, my wife never got to do any of that. And it was so bad with her growing up, they would argue about opinions, and she would end up conceding. It's a fucking opinion. There is no right or wrong. You can't be like, oh, yeah, you're right. Like, no, if you don't agree, like, tell me to fuck off and go in the other room. Like, it's, we don't have to agree. It's fine, right? Um, but when I met my, met my wife, she would do that to me. So we would be in an opinion argument, and she, like she would concede. And I'd be like, whoa, whoa, no. If you don't agree with me, it's fine. It's, it's an opinion, right? But the problem with her is she would come and ask me how to do something that she hadn't tried. And I find that that happens in leadership positions more often than not. And the reason why is they've had bad leadership previously. Because if they did try something and it was wrong, they got their asses ripped because they had no freedom to make decisions. The best thing you can do for leadership roles is to empower them to make uh, or to fail and to be wrong and to make mistakes. Because the only way that they'll ever progress to be the leader that you want them to be is if they trust their gut when they're making decisions. And if you're not letting them make any, they're never going to develop that. And it doesn't matter how long that they're under you for. So the quicker that you get comfortable with them kind of flying the plane themselves, and, and when they come to you to talk to, it, to you about things that broke, it isn't a, I can't believe that you fucked that up, because they're already going to feel bad, right? Especially if they care about your brand. But my system for going through a problem like that is they'll be like, okay, 
like we, we already know it was broken. I don't need to tell you it was broken. I'm not going to yell at you about it. I'm happy that you chose and made a decision. What I want to talk to you about is like, walk me through how you got there. Do you know what happens when I do that? They fucking find it themselves. But I had to learn that process because someone did it to me. <laughs> so it's not something I came up with on my own. But I had leadership that was always around me when I came in to consult businesses because they expected me to do the job they hired me to, to do, to fix shit. So if I came in and they gave me carte blanche to make decisions, and I'll never forget him. His name was Ed Scanlon, um, and, uh, and he was in Chicago. And I, I did something. It pushed up lead spend, and our, our close rate went down, I don't know, a percent and a half. So it wasn't like we were going to go out of business, right? But it was obviously the wrong decision. And uh, when we sat down, he was like, all right, so like you made this decision, blah, blah, work me or walk me through how you got there. And I was like, well, I looked at these numbers. I did this. I changed this. I did whatever. And then I moved through it. And he's like, and he just was looking at me. And I'm like, oh, fuck. He's like, what? I'm like, yeah, it's right here. I didn't even factor that. He goes, well, so we're not going to do that again? I was like, nope. He's like, all right. And that was the meeting. But the thing is that you're doing there is you're witnessing and listening to their thought their thought process and their problem solving. Instead of you going through, what about this? What about this? What about this? You're making them go through everything that they did to come to the answer they got to. And so what you're doing is you're slowly kind of tightening the way that they make decisions. Before you know it, they'll be able to finish your sentences. They'll be able to do things the way that you do them. Why? Because every time you sit down and have a coaching thing about decisions they made and, and choices that they, they made, you're walking through what was broken. And... <laughs> When you're asking, how did we get there? You're literally guiding them down the road that you need them to go down in order to find it. Because you're in control of the conversation. Like, oh, so you looked at these numbers. What about these numbers? Like, show me how you... But I'm taking them where I need them to go to find what I need them to find. I don't have to tell them it was wrong. Does that make sense? I fucking hate that line. I never even say it. I always say, did I explain that okay? Because did I, did that make sense? Insinuates I think you're stupid and can't get it. Anyway... Um, <laughs> But that was the way that I, that I handled that type of stuff. Um, and there's not going to be a quick fix for you to get guys to step into that role. But what you're going to have to make them comfortable with doing is understanding that this is on their shoulders now. Because your ability to scale is solely, solely fucking on their shoulders. Because either you're going to be able to delegate heavy to those people and move on to things that are scalable and stuff like that, or you're going to continuously coach those guys. Yeah, the other thing for me, too, is just patience. Like, a lot of my leaders, they've been with me for at least a couple of years, but I, and I think probably all of us can relate to this. We can see how quickly they can get to here, right? But they, they can't get to there that quickly, so it's just going to also, like, just easing off the throttle a little yep. bit and give them more room kind of to fuck up, like you said. And yep. Be more patient. Yeah. And that's what I mean. It's... It's okay to want to move fast, right? Like, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but at the same time, the people are going to move at the speed they're moving at. Um, and so if there's somebody that you think has all the core values and can do all the, the growing that you want, they're going to have to go at the pace they're going at. It kind of is what it is. Um, I've got like 12 minutes left, so I'm going to go into the last piece of what I was talking about. So we've kind of talked about systems a little bit. So the process to build systems is, you know, the first thing that you do is you try it. Um, in my business, I'm usually the first person to do anything. Um, why? That's just me. I don't ever ask anybody else to go and do something first. Um, I, I'll understand quicker where I think there's going to be hang-ups. Um, and then once I have the system built, then I'll delegate it to somebody else. And what I want that person to do is to record it. So they're going to go through the whole play. They're going to write down all the steps. They're going to, they're going to basically record the entire process, what the outlines and, and all that, what those are supposed to look like, right? And then we put it into play. So how many of you guys are familiar with the scientific method? Most people? So for those of you that aren't, the scientific method basically gives you a control piece. So your control is what happens in a vacuum. So if I have a situation and my business is running one way and I think something is broken, I need to be able to return to that exact stage in my business after I make a choice if whatever I move to doesn't make it better. Did I explain that okay? So, so you have to be able to go back to control if whatever you shift to doesn't fix the problem. If it does fix the problem, we have new control, right? 
And then we can move on from there to keep, to keep trying to make positive changes to the business to grow it. So after somebody records it and we deploy it, we can come back and be like, okay, is this system good? Does it need to be fixed? What's broken? Can it be made better? Whatever. After we have that perfect one, then we can start to scale it. So there's three rules in, in business for anything that you're going to put into your place. Everything you need to, be, uh, need to have needs to be scalable, right? Needs to be predictable. And uh, scalable, predictable, and repeatable. So anything that you're doing, any systems that you're putting in place, all three of those things need to apply to it. It needs to scale. It needs to be repeatable, right? And you need to be able to measure it. That's the, the only three rules that you ever have to have when it comes to building a system. Because if you can't do any of those things, then you know that there's going to be a bottleneck somewhere. Either it's you, it's a division in your company, it's a person that has to have a conversation, right? Because you want to remove yourself from all of that shit. And that's the only way to scale fast. So if you look at the way that, um, that Google did stuff and things like that, they took a product and then they, st they would make it one thing good, and they would move on to the next one. And I think a lot of people in business get trigger happy and they start trying to buckshot shit and try to do 100 things. Um, there's people that I've met that they have a new business entity every fucking four months. Um, I don't know, there's some, one guy in Entourage that blocked me because I literally told him, I don't even know what the fuck you do. Um, I think Brandon was on that thread. Yeah, okay. Um, that kind of shit's just obnoxious. Like, it, it doesn't give off any type of um, expert, like, vibes. It'd be hard for me to do business with somebody that I don't know what the fuck they do. Um, and a lot of people are afraid to stay in their lane. But if you, think about, if you think about your employees and your business the same way that Google felt about Yahoo, you'll have a lot more success. And the difference between the two, right? Yahoo wanted you to stay on Yahoo's website for as long as humanly possible. They wanted you reading their news, their sports, using their email, right? And their whole entire thing was about site time. How long could they keep you on yahoo.com? And that was why Yahoo started adding all of that shit to their platform, because they didn't want you to leave. Google's response was, where do you want to go? And we'll take you there. And they absolutely crushed Yahoo. We know how all of that ended up. So in your business with your employees, if you focus more on where they want to go, versus where you're trying to take them, you'll have a lot more success with making sure that they, you get what, what um, or get out of them what they can give. Just to add on to that point, when I was working at Oracle, they used to stick all the engineers into a room for 24 hours and not let them out. They have to go and present an idea to the executive team. That's how, like, Gmail started. Yeah. One of the biggest things that I got criticized for early on in my career, and maybe it, was, maybe it was too forward thinking at the time, I would rather have more brains at the table than less. As a business owner, we always like to choke stuff, right? But I, I could hire an 18-year-old that might give me the best idea I've ever heard of. And the thing is, most of us are going to reject any ideas they bring us because they haven't been around here long enough. Um, I'll listen to anything for five minutes. 99 times, it may suck. The hundredth one, it could change my fucking life. And all I had to do is spend 500 mis minutes listening to shit. But a lot of people don't do it. Um, your, your biggest asset are, are the brains that you have that are part of your business. And if you're not leveraging those people as often as possible, you're missing out on things that they could do or that they would bring up that could change the way that you do business in a way that you would never come up with. Um, the best uh, analogy I can give to that is, do any of you, any of you, anybody in here draw or paint or anything like that? You do? So one of the things I've noticed of people that are, are very detailed when it comes to art, they'll fixate on a very small portion of what they're working on. And they'll, they'll get in there, they're this close to the canvas, they're looking at brush strokes, they're making shit close, and then when they back up, this corner is so fucking different from the rest of the painting that they almost have to start over. And that's what we are as business owners. We are way too fucking close to the painting. So if someone else walks in the room and looks at the painting and be like, what the fuck is going on in this corner? And like, we're going to get offended, 
right? Because we spent the most time ever on this fucking corner, and it's amazing, but it, doesn't, it has nothing to do with the picture. Because we got fixated on this one problem, and that's all we wanted to fix. So if I engage all of my staff all the time, what can we do? How can we improve um, uh, customer um, like processes? How can we make their, their stuff less you know, painless or whatever? Some of the best ideas I got were not even mine. And I'm okay with that. Like At one point in my life, I was not okay with it. Um, I had to have all the answers. My shit had to be right. I didn't want to be argued with. I, at this point, I'd rather be the dumbest person in the room, to be honest. Um, if I'm the smartest person in the room, there ain't shit I can learn. <laughs> so it'd be a waste of my time. Um, but I, if you've got people that are coming in that weren't part of your industry before, um, or people that you're hiring, like build a system around getting their feedback and address it. You know, a lot of times people will talk to you about stuff on technology that you've never even heard of. Like, oh, there's this new system that does it. Why didn't you fucking say that six months ago? Well, I didn't know that you would do anything about it. That's my fault. Because I, I made them think that I wasn't interested in their opinion. That's a, that's a problem with leadership. No one should ever feel like they can't come to you with an idea. So if you're doing that, you're stifling all of the brains that you have access to that know anything about your business. Um, and people are always worried about giving their boss feedback too, right? Like, what if I tell him his business model sucks? Is he going to fire me? Like, that isn't how it works. Like, it needs to be free range. And my biggest thing that I can tell you, if you choose to make those changes and build those systems where you're going to staff and getting feedback, do it as a round table. I know that there is risk in that because it can snowball. If your culture is a little toxic, that can turn into a messy fucking meeting. The thing is, at some point, you're going to have to face it. So the sooner you do it, the better, right? But then everybody winds up on the same team, giving the same feedback. And that's the, the best way that you can do it. The, the one thing I would think that, that I struggled with the most when it came to doing that was I, if, I, if someone came to me with an idea, I would shut it down, and I wouldn't explain why. And you've all been through that, right? Like you came to somebody with an idea, and they're like, nah. It's like that will crush you more than anything else. Because now you don't even, now you just feel dumb. <laughs> like, I went to him with this great fucking idea I spent an hour on, and all, it was no. The, the best thing I started doing was explaining why I said no. Because people are going to come to you, especially new employees, and they're going to want to try stuff you've already tried. But you don't want to shoo it off, because if you shoo it off, they'll never come to you again. And that was a problem I created for myself. Because I, was an, I didn't want to take five minutes out to explain to him, hey, you came up with this idea. It was actually a really good idea. It was something that we tried at one point. This is how it failed or why it didn't work. What ended up happening is I would get, well, what if we tried this? And be like, well, I never fucking thought of that. <laughs> you know? But it's a humbling experience not being, being the one in control, right? Because most people think the CEO, the whatever, like you have to be the decision maker. You're the fucking point guard. You're supposed to run the play. And so just like all of the plays that you have for how you make sandwiches, how you brush your teeth, how you go to the grocery store, and all of that, there should be a system for just about everything in your life. And if you actually sat down and thought about it, you've developed more systems over your lifetime that you do completely mindlessly than you've even ever dreamt of. And it's not hard to build a system. You just have to do it. Because after you implement it, you can change it. But if all you're going to do is have meetings about meetings about shit that's broken, it's still fucking broken. So if you make a new system and the new system's fucking, it's still fucking broken. What do you care? Right? But no one wants to do it because what if it's worse? What if it's not worse? What if it's better? And so that's like, I guess the challenge I would leave everybody with, hey, I did all right. Minute, 20 seconds left. Um, that would what I'd be, uh, want to challenge everybody to do, is to go home and, and dig into the systems that you have in your life and start trying to figure out all of these problems that you've got, right? If it's emotional IQ, how do you get better at reading emotions? Fucking paying attention to them. 
When someone's talking to you, are you hearing what they're saying? Or are you worried about what you're going to say, ne say next? That's tied to emotional intelligence. Because if you don't have enough time to process what they said, you're not feeling what, what they're telling you. If you can always fire back with a response the moment someone is done talking, you miss the last 10 or 12 words that they said. There should be a pause. I don't pause that often. <laughs> it's something I'm very conscious of. But I know, I know that I'm supposed to. And so it's easy for me to be like, yeah, I've got a system in place where I'm trying to pause after someone, someone's done talking. One, to make sure they're done. Right? But two, I need to process it for a second. Because it's the only way that I can have an intelligent response to what they said. Anybody have anything left? We've got zero seconds. How granular do you get when you're trying to you build businesses or help you build businesses? So uh, when you say, like, I need a system for my citizens, like how granular do you get with the sales team? Well, so any system you're going to build, you're going to start at the top of the funnel. Um, what's crazy is when, when, when I start talking about systems, people want to fucking build SOPs immediately. It's like, SOPs are granular as fuck. Like, what, is, what are we building an SOP for? Well, like, for the sales team. No, thanks. But, like, what part of it? Is it an SOP for how they fucking clock in? Is it for how, how a phone call goes? How many of you guys that have sales stuff, how many of you guys still use scripts? couple of you guys? Um, when I used to use scripts, I'd make people memorize them just so I could show them how to utilize them because I just wanted to see if they'd fucking memorize it. I didn't care if they recited it word for word. I wrote it. It's not going to, it won't come out of their mouth the same way it does out of mine. But after they did memorize it, I could coach them on how to own it, right? Because there's certain shit they got to talk about. There's stuff they can't leave out. Um, and so it always starts at wherever you're at. If you have no systems, the first system should, you know, should be about how people come to work and how they set up their whatever. Then it's moving into you know, your CRM stuff and how stuff gets you know, rolled out or whatever. Then you get into sales flow and, and all of that kind of stuff. But it's, you have to start at point A. And it's hard for people that have businesses already because there's a way that you do stuff. Which, believe it or not, that's a fucking system. Um, you just have to go through and edit it. And if you already have a sales team and you don't have good systems in place for the sales team, it's good to sit down with the sales team and be like, if we're going to put a system together and normalize all of this stuff, you know, Steve, you do this really good. Jeff, you do this really good. I think we're going to merge those. Would there be a way that you guys could sit down and put on paper the way that you guys go through this? Because I would love to duplicate what you guys do. Now they have ownership of their own systems. They have ownership in the brand now. Now when you've got 100 salespeople, Steve and Jeff had part of making the system for the sales team. And that's ways that you can help with your culture and stuff like that, so you're not always the fucking hammer that's bringing information people. Did I answer that? Anybody else say anything? No? I'm negative time now. No one's doing this, so that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, anyway, like I said, my name is Jacob. Hopefully I didn't put anybody to sleep and this helped a little bit. Um, you can find me on Facebook and stuff if you have any questions about any stuff I talked about. I usually think of shit to ask like two hours after the person I should ask the question to was available. So um, if y'all have any questions or want to chat about anything, give me a shout. Um, but other than that, any of you guys going to be here tomorrow for the car show deal? Yeah? Cool. Yeah, I got uh, some of the Lambo Club Dallas guys coming through and shit like that, so there should be some cool cars here. But other than that, I guess I'm done. Thanks, guys.